Uh, thank you all for, for attending, coming today uh, and listening. We really appreciate it. We, ho we hope what we're trying to put together over the next few days is really helpful and, and can help you think about moving some of your funding from that, that really strong focus on community, which you all have brought in those surveys, to opportunities and options that might be out there for you. I think some of the stuff Laura's put out there should hopefully really point you in the right direction of things that are available now. So please do <clears throat> you know, make the most and explore that. What I want to talk about a bit for the next half hour or so is, is how you kind of go alongside looking for the next thing to apply for, how you get yourselves ready as organisations for, for funding applications, what are some of the basic principles and things you need to think about to need to write an application and help you think about how you actually construct projects or uh, wider budgets to to make them convincing and stand out so let's see how that goes eh? um excuse the hair as phil's already mentioned it's getting bad so you know if you're feeling bored just have a little look and a laugh i'm very happy for that um amusing photos with lego men are available on our blog um, <laughs> Right, so the first thing you've got to do whenever you're doing funding is about building the appeal of your organisation, okay? Um, identifying grants is great, and, and there's a lot of hard work involved with that, but actually going out and winning it, it, it really can be where the hard work begins. A lot of graft to go through and planning and having a structured approach is key. Um, but vitally, you've got to try and help you and your organisation stand out from the crowd. Uh, and there's a few basic things you need to do to make that work. And we'll talk about a few of these through this presentation. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is something that should be fundamental to what you're doing as an organization. That's knowing really clearly what your mission is and what your aims are as a, as a charity. You want to be clear in your head why you exist and what you're trying to achieve because you need to be able to communicate that really clearly, really simply, really succinctly in any application you're doing, whoever it's to. You need to tell them why you're there. And following on from that really clearly, you need to tell them what the need is for you to exist. You need to prove that your community, your patients, kind of support and that there are stories out there that are compelling that make that funder that you're applying to care um, it's it's simple it's obvious but it's, it's really important to do that and ideally you know access some of those personal stories um, the journeys that people in your communities are, are, are going through this, their experiences and, and highlight where there might be struggles and issues that you're trying to support because that makes you more compelling it makes you stand out and gets people engaging with your applications and then obviously the third thing is to really make sure it's clear how you help them with that. How is the work that you're doing helping them on their day-to-day -day lives, helping to move towards the objective you've laid out? And these are fundamental things that you should kind of have a sense of always as an organization anyway, uh, but you need to be able to communicate really nice and quickly. It's that elevator pitch style of things. Um, now from there, we then need to think a bit more detail about um, the applications you're going to make themselves and in any application you are making an ask what is the ask what are you asking for support for your existence as an organization or is it for a specific project um, a task that you're trying to complete a piece of help you're trying to give and how much money how much support what do you need to deliver that uh, and also an important thing to think about is how much are you asking for within that application so it might be that the project you're asking for requires quite a large budget of £20,000 or so, but in this given application, you're asking for a proportion of that. And it's really important to understand that before you start your application and to make sure you communicate that nice and clearly. Alongside an ask, you always have to show what value that has. It's no good asking for some money if it's not clear to the funder how that money is actually going to help, what you're going to spend it on, and what will spending it on this do to help you achieve your aims. Show that the money they're giving has value to you as an organisation and to your beneficiaries. Um, and a final really important one to always consider are success measures. Um, this is something we'll come back to again and again. And I'll talk to uh, you about in more detail at the end. Uh, but essentially, it's really important that you can show that you're trying to demonstrate um, that you've succeeded in your aims of your project, that you have some record to show, hey, we did this. People came to this event. People benefited from it in some way because that lets them know that the funding they've given has been helpful. And it also helps you down the line. This is all kind of core basic stuff, and I'm sure we'll go into much more detail about that as part of the um, training tomorrow when we talk about how to write these applications. But it's fundamental you have these basics in place when you're thinking about how you go about fundraising. And when you're there, um, you need to start thinking about the types of funding you're going to go for. And Laura's quite nicely outlined this kind of difference between projects and organisations, uh, and the way that you can use project funding or organisational funding. And there's different things and, and ways you can compare them. So in a project, you're obviously addressing a single part of your work, a facet. It's, uh, it might be an event that you're running. It might be uh, a newsletter. It might be um, a, a podcast, an online thing. It's a subset of what you're doing. 
if you're looking to fund your organization, you want them to support all of your work. So any application needs to reflect what it is you do. Uh, in project funding, um, you're looking to fund all of the specific costs tied to that project. And, and as Laura's already said, and it's really important to stress that can include, and if you have them, should include costs on that project and the time that has been spent to deliver it. Um, for organizational funding, it's, it's more likely to be explicitly funding those core costs, those overarching costs for you to run your organization to let you do your work. Uh, in project funding, you should have really a, a very clear set of aims and outcomes for that project. And that goes back to the value of the funding and what you're trying to do with the project. When you're looking at organizational funding, of course, you still need to do that, uh, but it's more funding that's a, uh, about supporting your purpose as an organization. So you focus on that broader picture of what the organization is trying to achieve rather than the specifics of each individual project. Therefore, when you're looking at project-based funding, you really do need that detailed, clear and complete budget. And this is where you can get down to the nitty gritty in your budgeting. Um, you don't have to budget for every single paperclip, but you know you do need to include things like printing costs for a specific thing. You want to where you might need and really try and delve that into a good level of detail. Um, on organizational funding, you're gonna be more generalized in the budget that you're doing. You don't need to worry so much about every item of things you might need in your office, but you do need to list office costs potentially as a line item within that. You don't necessarily need to budget for every hour of your member of staff, but you do actually need to say what budget you need for the staff in place. And it's again, a different level that you're looking at. Um, project funding, um, it's a really nice opportunity to target some funding sources that can um, really tie into maybe the way you're delivering the project or delivering the project in. It lets you open up those different opportunities, which Laura's really nicely outlined. Uh, you can go and find a project, a fund that uh, supports uh, digital projects if you're trying to run webinars, for example, which you might not otherwise be able to access if you're looking at an organizational level. Organizational funding, you need to go out and find those funders that are really all about supporting organizational growth, uh, supporting specific roles, or supporting the broad theme and mission of your charity as a whole. Um, what this kind of means is project funding is great because it can really open up that big diversity of funding opportunities. And often the project will have a, a smaller total budget. So it's sometimes easier to get that single funder to support that whole initiative. And that can be really helpful and more efficient for you. Um, it also means there's different ways to, to bring funds in. If you're looking at organizational funding, um, some it might feel or you might find fewer funds that may be applicable for you to do that. Um, but there are single funders out there who might support a whole role for your organization if you're looking at staff costs, which is which is a good thing. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that it might be the case that you may not want to have a funding the whole of your organization. There may be cases where that's fine, but particularly in corporate fundraising, for example, you may not want to have um, a huge part of your staffing costs or organizational costs covered by a single company because there's issues of comp competition of interest there. So it's worth thinking a little bit about. Um, very generally, and it's always worth being stressing, many of these things are generalities here. Um, with project funding, you're probably going to be looking at something that's shorter term or is more likely to be on the shorter term side of funding. Uh, it might be for an event, a bit of a project, uh, a year of a project, for example. Though you can obviously get project funding that can last multiple years. That tends to be a little harder to access and need a longer application. Organizational funding is more likely that you're going to be looking at a longer term type of funding uh, and that's probably going to be supporting you for a period of time as an organization which can run into multiple years and that's that's really what we all are looking for. Okay so if we're looking at things in that way how do we then look at projects? In many cases we might be thinking about what well, as discrete projects we just go out and do the work that is needed to help patients and patient organizations so how do we break things down into project chunks because clearly it is a good way to diversify your funding and access these different pots um, as Laura already pointed out and you think about the projects you're kind of already running that are established and think about what new ideas you might have because there are different approaches uh, from different organizations different funders towards pilot studies or new studies uh, and established things and some funders only want one or the other and sometimes there'll be different ways you have to approach things with them um, you will generally often see um, that pilot projects might have slightly lower budgets attached to them at some times because it's harder to know what the cost might be. But if you're looking for that bigger budget, maybe with a more established project, um, you can kind of evidence that the project works and you are the people to run it. And that always helps as a way to think about things as well. 
Um, so, okay, here's a project. This is a project we have um, put together ourselves very recently. It's not one we've gone out and sort, sort of funding for, but it's uh, something we've called Rare Chat. The idea is we're trying to have some Zoom meetings where patient groups that we're working with can come in and just have a chat about a specific topic to one another. Uh, we've done this because COVID-19 um, isolation land, we can't run face-to-face -face events and it's really hard to get those patient groups interacting. And, and we believe uh, a big benefit of some of the work we try and do to find a cure is patient groups talking to one another and learning from each other um, so we have come up with a project so when developing our project we need to consider different things um, we try and think of what it's called we try and give it a brand um, which makes it easier to talk about that as an entity um, my internet says it's unstable so i'm just going to hold up yeah good um, it helps you to frame that project nicely uh, and you want to know what the role of it is what's the purpose of this the project is about getting online conversations between people who are locked down during COVID-19. You want to think about what the need that it's addressing and if it's suitable to, uh, as an intervention, suitable as a, to address that problem. Well, in this case, people can't talk unless they have a means to communicate virtually. And this does that. And we think there is a real benefit and a need for groups to talk to one another and share their experiences. So it seems straightforward. You want to think about ways you can measure the success or the impact of the project you're doing whenever you're developing it. For us, we could just simply look at signups, the number of people who return to the session, the amount of conversation we have during the session, how hard it is to actually hang the session up at the end, possibly. This is a very low touch project for us, but there's a whole range of ways you can think about measuring how this is helping people. And that might just be running a survey afterwards. And what actually do you need to deliver that project? So what resources are necessary? Um, we need to uh, and we need time from our staff to actually sit down and think of topics and, and run the session as well. Um, another thing that's always we're thinking about when planning a project or thinking about an intervention is uh, what burden might that project impose? You're trying to help people in some way, but it might also have a cost. So the example of this is our workshops. We know that people tend to have to pay significant funds to travel to attend them face to face. We think there's value in that and lessen that burden so we always ask for funding um, to cover travel expenses for patient groups who are coming along to that we're lessening the burden we're imposing for them to access it um, there'll always be a burden of time it's very hard to lessen that but we try and find ways to to ensure people can come and attend the thing they want to attend as well and always worth thinking about and something we occasionally fail on ourselves is thinking who will have time and effort and energy to deliver that project and how long it will take. Getting a good idea of that helps you in your budgeting, which is very important, but also this is the right project for you if you're coming up with a new project, which this is an example of, or really making sure you build strong budgets around the time you're taking if it's an established project. So these kind of things are really helpful to help you think about turning what you're doing into project space. And, and most of you would be running lots of projects anyway. When you're doing that, it allows you to move on to that challenging, exciting world of building budgets. Um, and this is, this is a really important part of the fundraising endeavor, obviously. Um, you've got to try and know how much money you need and ask for the right amount of money so you can deliver it. Because the worst thing you can do is ask for a certain amount of money and spend twice that because you can't then deliver what you're after or you can't do the work. Um, it's really important to get good budgets as well for your fundraising applications because it makes your applications very transparent. Uh, it makes you look more professional to funders and it gives them confidence that you know what you're doing and can deliver the work. So spending time on budgeting is, is well worth it. There are three kind of big pools that you're gonna have money uh, costs falling into and those are gonna be direct project costs. And these are the things that I would think all of you are thinking about by default when you're thinking about your project, what it costs to actually do the thing. And that's why we all start on fundraising applications. There's gonna be core costs. The costs that are tied to actually running your organization and running that project and capital costs. So costs to actually buy infrastructure. So in our direct project costs, these can cover a whole range of things. It might be a piece of software that you need. Uh, it might be the cost to hire a speaker for an event potentially. Travel expenses, which can include the speaker costs, but it may include your beneficiaries to travel to an event that you're running. You might need to get um, funding to put people up in a hotel for a patient day, which is a common thing I hear about from lots of patient groups. Cost of venues, catering. You might decide you need to hire some consultancy to be writing a scientific paper or putting together some uh, medical guidelines, for example, and that will have a fixed cost. Um, support with web design or web support, always uh, involved in lots of projects these days. The cost of actually promoting your event, going out and advertising it in some manner. 
It might be you need to do Facebook adverts and pay a bit for that. It might be you simply need a designer to help you make a poster. And of course, the cost of printing. It's just printing off on your printer at home on A4 or going to a, a printing guy to make a whole batch of leaflets for you. These are all costs that are going to be rolled into projects you're making. Our core costs are those ongoing costs of running your organization and these will vary depending on your current size and status whether you're fully voluntary or have staff but I think it's always worth considering them regardless of, of that status. Um, there's a huge range of things that are core and fundamental to what you're doing and, and you know if you have staff then you have salary costs okay you have costs of staff support but even if you have volunteers you have costs possibly of them traveling to certain events they have out-of-pocket expenses that is good for you to try and cover if you can you might want to do some training with your volunteers and having a budget available or funds available to train them is always worthwhile um, as since we all have to get our annual accounts done as charities so that is a core cost fundamental to running your organization you might want to think about working that into your budgets for either your overall funding or a specific project in some manner rent office supplies your electricity bill if you have staff or even actually the cost for you as a person running an organization to manage your staff you should try and work that into your budgets wherever possible because it's very hard to go to someone and ask for hi i want to be paid to manage somebody but actually it should be part of your capital you can make it possible because it helps you build a budget that makes you more sustainable and those capital costs um, probably come up less often, but there are fundamental things we all need. And these are fixed one-time costs on equipment, maybe on land or, or construction, the common things we talk about, less relevant to our patient group side of things. Essentially, we're gonna be looking for computers. We're gonna be looking for audio visual equipment, maybe to film uh, and make videos. We may want vehicles for certain projects we're running in the community potentially. And, and if we're you know, going through it, we might, might want a building or land or something to deliver a project in a meaningful way. These are all things that can be worked into the budgets for what you're doing. So I want to talk a bit more about core costs because I think this is where it's generally the hardest part of any budget. And I've battled for, I don't know how many years I've been doing it now, three years or so, trying to find the right way to put core costs into our projects. Um, but if you get it right, it it's really helps you as an organization be sustainable. And it's really worth thinking about because I think for the bulk of Resi, it really is the people um, that are doing most of the work and are the crucial components for delivering what we're doing. So finding ways to, to provide some funding or support for that is going to make your life uh, better and easier and allow you to do more. So if, if you're only working for volunteers, which I know is the case for the majority of groups that we work with, it, it's really, you know, okay and important to think in your projects about including some budget to cover those out-of-pocket out of expenses. You know, what is the cost to go and do this particular bit of a project? How's it much, much the cost to get there? Are there certain costs you can cover to make um, your volunteers have to give less of their money towards the, 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 the task and, and feel happier to give more of their time? Uh, it's a good way to, to help um, recognize that volunteer support as well. Um, when you're doing um, funding for a big project, that might be an opportunity for you to begin to think about bringing in some funds um, that can be core to provide payment to staff. It might be a good way to take that step into the professional space if you want to. There are obviously huge considerations around that, but using that as a way into the budget is good. And that might be a way to get a part-time um, staff member on board or to pay someone for a specific project. I know of some charities that have kind of self-employed contractors, if you like, in their staff who can work for them on that basis for a short period. And that can really make a difference in the work you'll get done as an organization. And any funding application is an opportunity to begin thinking about that. However, do be aware of the guidelines um, around this kind of approach if you're looking at moving a, a voluntary trustee into a staff position, because there are a lot of issues around charity commission and how and what you're allowed to pay uh, trustees. So do bear that in mind and look into that if you're thinking about it as, a, as an approach. Now, if you're already looking at then it's really important to make sure you include all those added costs that come with employees into your budget, okay? And there's a, a good old list of them here. You've got to think about national insurance, pensions, their student loan, all of those are gonna come out of their salary if they're salaried staff. Think about the expenses that they incur. Um, it's great having their salaries, but if you can't pay to put them on the train to take them to a venue, that's a problem. Um, and think about training your staff as well. Uh, you want some budget in place to allow them to um, go to a virtual, um, training session or go along to training to, to learn how to do their role better because that will benefit your life. You can include the cost of staff management so if you're doing that 
try and include some component of that in a clear and transparent way. And if you're doing these long-term applications, if you're trying to go for multi-year applications, try and think a little bit in your budgeting about potential salary changes because that will be something that happens down the line and it's better to factor some of that in rather than um, worrying about it means you asking for more cash. Um, so do think about the long-term if you're going for that approach. All right, so that's something to think about. How do you actually do it? How do you allocate your budget for core costs? Um, there are probably more ways of doing this, but in my experience so far, there's about three different approaches you can use to tackle this. Uh, you can try and fund the whole position in one fell swoop, which is a great way to do things to keep things simple. Um, you can try and build your budget by the days of time you're expecting someone to work on a specific project. So you start budgeting by days, or you can use a kind of percentage time spent on a project method. And all of these are different ways you can begin to build your time budgets and therefore turn that into a financial budget. Uh, funding a position is easy for you in that it's a single hit. You know, this person costs you this much for this period of time, and it's very easy to write that application and put it together. Um, it isn't necessarily easier to get it funded, however. Um, you'll be looking at a higher value funding. Uh, that goes without saying that the cost for a person for a full-time or a part-time salary will be significant. Um, tends to be a bit hard to do with a project-based funding approach. It's you need a very specific role that you can tie to a whole project, clear why that whole role is associated only with that project. Um, and that project also needs to warrant that staff, that staff time as well. Funders are going to be critical of, of the approach you're using, and you need to make sure you can justify the need for that person as part of that project. Doing that. So, so given this, the route of funding whole positions probably works much more nicely if you're looking at that kind of organizational style of funding that there are certainly funders out there who are open and happy to fund staff positions within charities and, and that should be approach you should look at there budgeting by days kind of goes back down the, the opposite route and you're really trying to divvy up the time you're spending on different things um, ultimately there what you need to have is a calculation of a daily rate for your staff members what does it cost to have a member of staff per day or per hour but I recommend sticking to day if you can manage it. Uh, and that needs to cover all your costs. Um, if you have a delightful budget for every day someone's working, if you get to include their holiday days, then you're at a position where you've got to pay for staff's holiday out of your own pocket, which again, you don't want to do. So you need to try and cover that whole spectrum. That cost needs to account for the, the necessary holiday they're allowed uh, and into their employment, assuming you're not using a kind of private contractor route. Generally, if you're doing budgeting by days within your budgets, you're going to have a lower value of um, funding within that. You're going to be budgeting for the amount of time they're spending on specific projects. So it's not going to be so high as maybe funding a whole position. Um, the problem with this is it's hard to predict time. I've always struggled with this area. How much time you actually spend on something can be challenging and what counts as spending it on a project can also be challenging as well. So you have to think about how this builds up a big sustainable funding stream. Uh, you don't want to be in a position at the end of a year where you've funded half of the days um, of your staff and not all of the days of your staff. Uh, but it, it can be a really nice way to approach pilot projects. Um, if you're looking for a funder who wants to support something new, um, you're not quite sure how it's going to build and develop, uh, and you've not got a track record on this area, it shows that you're, you're budgeting a sensible way to build up a, uh, an approach. And, and early on, I think budgeting by days might be a nice way to go. It's certainly a lot of the work we did early on as a charity. Um, the final one is, is percentage of time. Um, I think this is an approach between the two. Um, it really allows you to fund quite high value, quite low value positions, depending on what you're looking to do. Uh, you're basically saying this member of staff is 30% of their time on this project, on this area. Um, you need to be able to justify that percentage of time and, and clarify that's the right amount for, for you and for them. Uh, but it does allow you to build a more sustainable funding stream because you can go out there and find the different chunks and percentages to add up to your total. And you should have a rough idea of what you need for your overall organisational budget. And it also helps to cover the cost of intangible things like those holidays, like the hours you will spend answering emails. Um, no one really wants to pay for you to write those emails, but fancy your emails, right? So you need to find a way to make sure you cover the cost of that. Um, and I think this works really nicely for some of those more established projects. Um, where there's lots of different people contributing to it in different ways. So we're tending to use this approach more at Mind the Cure at the moment for how we're giving up our budgets and our timing. 
Kate, the final major thing I want to talk about um, is monitoring and evaluation. Uh, it's, it's going on about how do you actually assess if you're being effective in the projects you're delivering. And, and really when you're applying for grants and, and foundations in particular, it's really important to think about this because funders want to know that what they're funding is successful and they want you to be able to prove that. And it's important that you can go back to your funders and report on what you've done and how successful it was. And you have to therefore think about it at the start of your project. Um, it can be really, really simple, but just doing some can really help you with this regard. Just track the people who are engaging with the work you're doing. If it's just counting heads who attend, having that on record, that's a simple way for you to say what has done, uh, what, what impact you've had and who has attended and engaged with what you're doing. Think about running surveys with your beneficiaries. That could be a survey at the end of an event. It could be an annual survey you send out to your members and just to find out what their needs are and what they liked about what you're doing. And, and collect some feedback as well. Try and collect quotes uh, and stories from people you show what their need is, but also how you've helped them, because that kind of thing, just a simple qualitative um, piece of text, quantity, yeah, a, a piece of text, a story from somebody can really make a difference in an application because it, it has that personal connection. Uh, and these, none of these things are particularly hard to do, but having a basic plan of how to monitor that makes a big difference. And it's worth saying that sometimes I think we all feel like going out and having to think about how you're monitoring things, collecting this kind of data feels like you're doing a task that is stopping you actually delivering benefit to the beneficiaries. And, and I think we all have days when that can uh, be a bit of a drag. It's not necessarily you don't start a charity because you want to run surveys, right? But you start a charity because you want to help people. And actually monitoring and evaluating the work you're doing is crucial to doing being more successful at that okay it proves the value that you have to funders it proves to you that what you're doing is beneficial it gives you whole new ideas about what you can do and be more effective um, and that's crucial because it lets you then plan better projects and it lets you have a track record that you're doing a good job and that lets you take that to funders for future applications to really help you begin to access more funds from a wider audience so just don't um, don't be scared of doing the basics in this area. It really makes a difference for you down the line. Right, and almost in the right amount of time, I'll give my summary. Um, successful fundraising is really hard. Okay, we all know that. Um, it relies on lots of different variables, but there's lots of basic things you can do to make yourself uh, more successful and put yourself in a really good position to access the funds that you want. Um, it's, it's just important to have that clear mission and message tied up because you can apply that across a whole range of different um, communication applications just to show what your purpose is and how you are helping. Everything needs to be tailored, but fundamentally what you do should just be flowing off the tongue if possible. Um, try and think about the work you're doing in terms of projects. Organizational funding is great. You want to have both, but the more you can use projects, the more you can unlock opportunities different funding streams and think outside the box as laura said to find ways to bring funds into your organization if you're just googling if people are going to fund rare diseases you're going to be at this for a long time um, try and build budgets for your projects and try and build them in detail because it gives transparency to your funders it gives you confidence that you're getting the funding that you need to deliver projects and it helps to demonstrate your credibility and that's going to make people more likely to fund you Always monitor the work that you're doing, even in the most basic way. It just makes a huge difference to your future work and to, again, look at that uh, like a credible organisation to funders. And reporting back to them helps to build that relationship, which can turn short term funding into long term funding. Um, and don't be evade to value your time. Um, try and find a way to bring in funds to support staff down the line or to support your volunteers wherever you can, uh, because I think actually the staff are fundamental to the success of all small charities we need to do what we can to tap into that and make sure we're asking for the money that we need which is what laura was stressing make sure you ask for what you want and what you need and, and keep asking the right people and you will get success <laughs>